also ready or not yet? Yes, they are in. We can. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, the limb ready? Yeah, sure. Uh, can we start? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our weekly webinar organized by College of Physicians Malaysia. The theme of the month is palliative medicine, and the topic for today is the role of palliative care in patients with renal failure. We are very delighted to have with us today our chairperson. Dr. Mwan Jun, who is a consultant, who is a palliative physician and also head of palliative care unit from Hospital Queen Elizabeth Kota Kinabalu. And without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Mwan Jun. Thank you so much, Dr. Lim. It gives me great pleasure to be here uh, chairing the session today and introduce our speaker. We have actually started um, kidney supportive care service as well in Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Um, we are at the beginning stage and we look uh, forward very much to hear from Dr. Shariza, our speaker today, on how to um, build the service um, better. So... We have Dr. Shariza Izua Zainuddin uh, today uh, with us our speaker, as our speaker. She graduated from UM um, in 2005 and completed her physician training in 2011 in University of Malaya as well. She then completed her training in palliative care, palliative medicine, both locally as well as um, overseas in various parts of the world, including... Auckland, as well as the Calicat. Dr. Shariza is now the head of palliative um, department in UMMC, and she has special interest in uh, uh, kidney supportive care, of which she started the kidney supportive care service in UM since 2017. And I'm very delighted to, uh, to welcome her, Dr. Shariza. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Ng, and also thank you, Dr. Lin. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ng, for the kind introduction. Uh, yes, uh, I am now uh, uh, heading the renal palliative uh, clinic and uh, service in UMMC, and I'm actually very delighted to be invited by the College of Physicians of Malaysia to share my experience with all of you today. So let me share with you my slides now. So I hope you all can see my slide and I will start. So today I have been given the opportunity to share with all of you regarding the role of palliative care in uh, patients with renal failure. So you all must be wondering what simply can palliative do in patients with renal failure. So uh, my lecture overview, I will definitely define regarding palliative care, very short one. Then I'll share regarding the role of palliative in ancestral disease patients. What is exactly the objective of palliative care or even conservative care? So some of the places or even the services we do like to not call palliative uh, renal service, but conservative renal care. And uh, lastly, I will share regarding the UMMC model that I have started since 2017. So what is simply palliative care. So by WHO definition, palliative care is an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families. So we don't only look after patients, but we also look after their families. Who are these patients? They are patients who are having or facing problems associated with life-threatening illnesses through prevention and relief of suffering by means of early identification. Uh, so we also do impactable assessment treat the most common symptom, which is pain, other physical problems, psychosocial and spiritual aspects. So spiritual aspect here would be more of a healing of life as compared to just the religion. Yeah. So let's start off today's uh, 
but to this part by uh, sharing with you some scenario just i'll go through a few scenario just have a think about this uh, scenario what would your uh, management be if you are facing with this patient so all these scenarios i'm sharing are real patients real patients that have uh, been treated by myself and my colleagues so mrs j 56 years old retired lady she's actually a chef who traveled the world she has background uh, history of multiple comorbidities, including CKD stage 5. She's married with two children, one of her daughter is a nurse. So she has uh, presented to the clinic, renal clinic, for CKD stage 5 and uh, has had symptoms of frequent leg swelling and persistently hyperkalemia. Apart from that, she's doing well. She does uh, go through on her travel, but she is very certain and she has decided that she will not want to go for dialysis if at any point we come to a time when she needs to go through RRP. She was the reason behind it, which she says that she has had family members who have died from end stage renal disease while on RRP, so she does not want to have a similar suffering. Okay, just think about her. Next, we have Madam H, 74, uh, 78 years old lady. Again, background history of diabetes, hypertension, and CKD. ADL independent, currently asymptomatic. She's aware of her diagnosis. She's aware of the prognosis without RRT. She's clear that she doesn't want to go for RRT, just hoping that she will dry naturally in the comfort of her home. Uh, so if you see, she has renal anemia. She has some amount of hyperkalemia that's a bit border, a hyper borderline. Uh, but she's clear she doesn't want anything in the Next one, very young, Mr. E, 54 years old, businessman, diabetes, hypertension with recurrent, uh, recent and uh, non-stemic, PGFR5. He came in with anemia and has severe uremic smell. He doesn't want to go through RRT due to financial issues. He's doesn't want to see any social worker to look into their financial assistance. He's ready to die, but he doesn't want his family members to see him suffering at end of life. So if you have this patient, how would you react to the patient's request? And do you think the patient's request is appropriate? So following this, my lecture will be trying to look into and explain to you what are the uh, whether this uh, request is appropriate, whether the patient's request is appropriate. Okay, so what is basically renal palliative or conservative management? Is it something new? So uh, I will show that this is not something new. It has been going on for quite some time because if you look into journals, you will see there's plenty of journals talking about, uh, uh, about conservative renal care or even palliative renal care. So some of this example in AJKD, we have advanced palliative care in patients with CKD from ideas to how they practice and go on. And then the next, there will, there's also papers about palliative care in patients with end stage renal disease, a meta analysis that was already uh, published in 2001, 21, sorry. And uh, recently, it also, uh, there is some uh, other journal stating about palliative care needs of patients living with end-stage renal disease not treated with any replacement therapy. So this is also done in other countries such as Malawi. Okay, so what does palliative uh, medicine play uh, play in the uh, end-stage renal disease? So as we are aware, the characteristic of people or patients who have or require RRT have changed over the years more and more elderly and more patients with poor mobilities are requiring RRP at one point or another. And we know that there has been four fold of increase of patients over the age of 75 in the Western world requiring RRP. And if we look at the mean age of patients commencing on RRP over the past few years in developed nations, it has been a mean of about 50 to 65. And as we know, there's also a change in the epidemiology of diabetes myelitis, and majority of patients who are end-stage renal disease are due to diabetic nephropathy. 
and studies uh, have shown or uh, have um, incidents have shown also that more than 50% in Singapore, Malaysia and New Zealand are due to require uh, RRP by, with renal stage, uh, and stage renal disease are due to nephropathy and this is also similar in other countries around the world. So, does everyone who has end stage renal disease require dialysis or need to start dialysis? Everyone is aware that any patients with end stage renal disease, whether or not they undergo RRT, would already have a reduced life expectancy as compared to somebody of similar age without end stage renal disease. And we also know that patients with end stage renal disease have significant symptom burden, symptoms that they develop due to both the disease, end stage renal disease, and their comorbidities. So how do we make a decision around dialysis? Should everyone with ancestral disease start dialysis? So that's one we are going to answer. And what is the survival? If they do not start dialysis or do they when they start dialysis? So again, I want to put some papers. So these are a lot of studies by Muntaj regarding dialysis or not. Comparative study about survival of patients over 75 years old with chronic kidney disease stage 5. So here, we can clearly say in this uh, paper that the survival of patients with end stage renal disease when they are put on dialysis significantly improved. If you see, conservative, of course, the uh, survival decreased over time. Okay. However, the survival benefit of these patients will be lost if one of their comorbidities include IHD. So whether or not they do dialysis or not dialysis or conservative, if one of their comorbidities is IHD, survival is similar. So in summary, in, in any patients with CKD stage 5 who are over 75 years old, even with specialized nephrology care, uh, the survival advantage of dialysis is reduced by the commodity of ischemic heart disease in particular. And when we talk about um, dialysis for an elderly patient, comorbidity should be a major consideration when we advise patients for or against dialysis. Okay, so I would like to quote other uh, guidelines. So for one guideline here, I'm quoting is from the Council of Australian and New Zealand Society of Nephrology and Board of Kidney Health uh, Australia, where they call the CARI guidelines, which is caring for Australians with renal impairment. In their ethical uh, section or ethical consideration, they say that a useful point of starting dialysis or recommending dialysis is an expectation of survival with a quality of life acceptable to the patient and conservative care is a recognized option for patients with end stage renal disease. Okay, other guidelines. That's not the only guideline. Another guideline from the US, Renal Physician Association of US in 2010 in their clinical practice. <laughs> In the assessment in the social of the general of dialysis, again, in the recommendation of the school, it says that it is reasonable to consider again dialysis for any unsectional registration to have a very strong diagnosis for such things. Dialysis cannot be provided. Sorry to interrupt, Sheriza. Your voice is um, not very clear. Okay, sorry. Let me increase my volume. Is that okay? Is that no, okay? it's a muffle. Is there any way? Are you speaking oh, directly? Uh, <laughs> Sheriza? Hello? Ah, yes, better. Thank you, Sheriza. Yeah. That's better. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I I share back my screen. Is that okay? Yes. Okay, so uh for recommendation six, it says that we have to it is okay to forego dialysis for any patient who have very poor prognosis 
or for whom we cannot provide diagnosis safely. And the latest one in 2018 with the nice uh, National Institute of Health and Care Excellence, uh, where they talk about renal replacement therapy and conservative management. The guideline here has a section on conservative care management, whereby they state that for conservative management, we have to ensure that the decision about RRT modality or conservative management are made jointly with the patient or with any of their family members or uh, carers uh, and the health care uh, team and have to look into predicted quality of life, predicted life expectancy, what is the person's preference, and of course, uh, co-existing condition. And we should also offer patient and family regular opportunities to review their decision about RRC modality in conservative and discuss about their concern and changes in preference. So in this, it says that uh, even though patients decide to be an RRC, it is always still an open discussion for us to discuss what is it or what they think about it. So if we are talking about renal palliative, who will make the decision? So it can be decided in consultation with a nephrologist or the treating physician. Or if this patient as an elderly have already decided on this management, what he needs to do is to express his choice, his uh, decision to his treating physician. And there have been also patients who have to undergo conservative or renal palliative because of unable to, uh, or because of issues with accessibility or even affordability. Okay? So uh, when is the timing? The timing can be from any, if at any point it is because of elderly and have already uh, stated that they do not want to have any RRC due to age, due to um, uh, quality of life, I would suggest the consultancy management be started early at stage three where we can control the fluid, the acidosis, the electrolyte much better and with a partnership with the patient, understanding where the prognosis and the uh, expectation of change that will happen as the disease progress. So sometimes uh, patients do request during free diabetes or even can be referred to us during diabetes when there's issue with diabetes or even excess. And at any point for withdrawal of diabetes, if at a, any point some patients do develop complications from the disease of end-stage renal disease or from any of the other comorbidities. So how can we help patients with man manage symptoms, uh, commonly pain and other symptoms related to CKD and comorbidities? Second, we help communicate regarding uh, evaluating treatment options, uh, symptom control, fluid control, uh, acidosis control. Again, next one, we explain regarding expectation during disease. So what are the expected changes? What are the expected symptoms that they will have? What will happen if they have fluid overload? What will happen if they have acidosis? And lastly, of course, we cope, uh, we help them, the patient and family cope with any psychosocial distress or even anxiety with the treatment and expected changes. So what are the objectives of end-stage renal disease conservative or palliative care? We want to preserve any residual renal function maximally. So with that, we have to have good uh, BP control, sugar control, uh, so uh, and acidosis to mention so that the decline of renal function is not uh, rapid, uh, symptom control, fluid or acidosis, psychosocial spiritual care, uh, we support the patient and the family through the disease process. And of course, we discuss with them regarding advanced care planning. So we discuss about uh, what are their expected, uh, expectation with disease progression, where is the end of life care, uh, if at any point they talk about nutrition, or even uh, if at any point some may also ask if there is any role of uh, RRT when necessary, there can be. Okay, so what are the models that I use in PPUM? It's just the same uh, model that we use 
as when we collaborate with the renal, uh, the oncologist and the gynecologist or even surgeon when we talk about any other palliative patient. So for renal palliative, it's more on palliative and the renal team. With also, I would say, uh, nursing coordinators, the renal nurse coordinator that we have in uh, UM. So the model that we use depends on the palliative needs. Is for the patient and the family. We have early and uh, collaboration. It's not about just taking over. So the the patient do not feel there's any abandonment. Okay. So what is the advantage of the model that I use is that both the team see the patient early in the stage of the disease. We have enough time to develop trust and rapport, and we cover a wide range of patients. Uh, just not only terminal patient or dying patient. So the model in UMMC or PPUM, uh, we have started with uh, renal palliative clinic since 2017. So what happened is uh, every Wednesday morning where there is a low clearance clinic with the nephrology, I will be sitting in one of the room in the clinic where the patients will come, patients who are on conservative care or renal palliative will come to see me. Uh, so before that, uh, what happened is I have done teaching for both the nurses and doctors in nephrology to talk about the referral criteria, what is the objective of palliative care or not. They don't know what is happening. It's just taking over, waiting for patients to progress and die. We discussed about criteria of referral, so if the patient has been admitted to the nephrology ward, we'll review patient in the ward. The palliative team will review the patient in the ward. We'll have multidisciplinary team meetings between uh, palliative and nephrology to discuss about what are the goals of care, what is the best management for this patient at this point of time. If at any point patients are already under palliative care, not for any active nephrology or uh, intervention, then uh, we do admit patients uh, to the ward for maybe uh, blood transfusion, control of fluid, maybe fluid overload. These are some of the examples. And there have been also patients who have uh, renal failure who do not do dialysis who choose to have their end of life at the hospital in our ward. So there will be regular follow-up in the renal palliative clinic for focusing on symptom management. At the same time, we will also discuss about psychosocial support for both patient and family. And there will be admissions to PCU for symptom control, fluid overload, acidosis, anemia, respite care, and supply care. So this is next is the referral criteria that we have discussed upon by our team, NEFO, and also palliative. So patients who can be referred from outpatient or inpatient, this patient may be end-stage renal disease patient suffering from symptoms that may require specialized opinion, uh, symptom palliation, and we have uh, decided that these are non-beneficial for RRT. They can also be patients who have complicated and resolved psychosocial problems. There can be continuity of palliative care of discharge patient and psychosocial intervention for patient and family who are under palliative care. So management or assessment of palliative care clinic in the renal clinic is similar. We get the medical history, we ask all these symptoms, but what I specialize, we will focus on the awareness of and goals. So we talk about patients' awareness of diagnosis and prognosis. We ask them, are they what is their attitude about towards death and dying? What are their patients' goal and expectation if they do not go RRT? Majority will say, yes, I know I will die. However, I will not die on the machine. I will die in the comfort of my home. So these are things that may we have to explore and aware of what their wishes are. So at the same time, the, we provide family support so that we explore whether the family is aware of the diagnosis and prognosis family expectation. So we will talk to, because some of the patient's family may, find, uh, may feel, you know, distress, not providing RRT for the family member, the mom, dad. So they feel, uh, am I uh, supporting the right decision, wrong decision? So these are things that we will support and explain to family members. Of course, spiritual aspect, 
in the sense of what is the meaning of life, any last wishes, and then we write upon management plan. So if at any point patients turn up to ED for fluid overload, acidosis, uh, during that time maybe they they, they are not uh, they are unable to express their, their wish, uh, so there would not be unnecessary intervention such as you know, putting in an IAC, uh, putting him on diabetes immediately, urgent diabetes. So these are things that we will discuss and put on in the uh, medical uh, record. So symptom management, we must be aware. Symptom management of patients with end stage renal disease are prevalent. There's multiple. This can be bothersome. Uh, it can be derived from end stage renal disease and other comorbidities. And symptoms interact and compound with each other. And certain medication use is also uh, contraindicated in stage renal disease, so we have to be cautious with our medication use. So what are the principles of management? We always have to think of the cause of the symptom. Be meticulous and always practice the principle of non abandoning So, uh, important thing in palliative care is psychosocial support. What do we do? We focus on symptom management. We focus on psychosocial support of the patient and family members, including their caregivers, and discuss about advanced care plan. So, palliation care. Palliative care of a palliative approach can play an important role throughout the course of end stage renal disease. However, what is the challenge? The challenge is to ensure that this pathway is not seen as the second best but inadequate. So I have shown you papers, guidelines to say that this is a non-option. It is not the second best option. It is a thorough, systematic and evidence-based. It's not about non-abandonment. It's not about simply transferring to palliative care. So we are still a multidisciplinary team where we can always discuss. So my nephrologist in UMMC, we are very close. We can always uh, talk about patients in the sense that, okay, I think this patient needs uh, uh, another assessment from the nephrology because they have second thoughts about RRT. But however, uh, at this point, it's pre-morbid, comorbidities, and also uh, maybe other factors is not at the best that may benefit from RRT. So these are things that we discuss in. Uh, our team in palliative care and also nephrology in PUM. So, I would like to just take, leave you all with some take home message. I'm at the end of my lecture already. So, uh, my take home message is number one, that there is a recognized need to provide palliative care service for patients with end stage renal disease in our country. There is also rec increasing recognition of the gap in service of providing palliative care for patients with end stage renal disease in Malaysia. There is also an increasing number of patients with CKD and stage renal disease who do not choose to have diabetes. So uh, it's not rare now. Uh, so they do come in and tell you, yes, I do not want diabetes. I do not want to do any more the RRC. I want to go conservative. Uh, there, this population of patients are usually elderly and with a lot of comorbidities. So we must remember that because of this, we need to control their symptoms. Uh, and if symptoms are poorly addressed, then we can also lead to problems about uh, prescribing medication and also addressing these symptoms. So palliative care can improve end-of-life care for patients with who are withdrawing from diabetes or those who do not choose for diabetes. And as you know, there, as Dr. Ng has also mentioned just now, her center also has started some service for renal. Uh, we here have started. There are several other hospitals in the Ministry of Health who are also developing this service, like in HKL. So there are development in such service to lead to more uh, patient uh, improve patient experience and with patients with conservative care or palliative care, advanced care planning is an essential part and it is essential to so that we can be able to meet their end of life priorities and help control their symptoms. So with that I open the floor for any questions.
Thank you so much, Dr. Sariza, for that uh, insightful talk. Questions are coming in, so we'll try to ask one by one. I'm seeing questions from the Q&A box. Dr. Zainal Abdullah for, from, uh, asked, sometimes when a patient becomes breathless or uremic, some family members may suddenly request for urgent dialysis, regardless of previous decision. So how would you navigate this? Okay. Uh, this is very good question, Dr. Zainal, because this is very common. That's the reason whenever we have this conversation with our patients, when they have decided that this is conservative care, they have said, this is my option. I do not want to do any RRT. Uh, one of the conversations you have to ask them, what happens if you come in breathlessness, you are unconscious, then if they say, yes, I'm aware this is disease progression, I do not want to have diabetes, uh, we clearly document at the same time. I would always advise one of the carers to be along, uh, be with the patient so that these people can be the patient, a person, spokesperson for the patient when the patient is unconscious and be able to uh, express the patient's wish in, at any point. So uh, if this happens, it's more about talking to patient's family, understand their prognosis. So just now remember, uh, what is our assessment in palliative clinic? Uh, symptom management, everything similar as when we are doing in clinic. However, what is extra in palliative care is the psychosocial support, talking about awareness of uh, the patient's prognosis, the goal of prognosis, what will happen, uh, expectation, uh, expectation of uh, disease that may change and occur. So these are things that we should uh, discuss so that the family will not be panicking and they are aware of oh, these are things that will happen at end of life. So uh, if they are supportive of it, they will know. Uh, or not, there will be unnecessary uh, intervention, you know, putting in IJC. I've had patients coming in unconscious and then family members not aware and then uh, suddenly uh, IJC did dialysis. Next morning, patient wake up, requested to see me and ask me, can you remove the IJC? I mm -hmm. said, cannot. Yeah, no. <laughs> And just once we initiate a therapy, I cannot just withdraw. We mm -hmm. can only withdraw when there is utility of therapy or there's no more added benefit or more harm to the therapy. That time is a nephrology that can only withdraw. Uh -huh. Okay? Yeah. So I hope I answer Dr. Zainal. Thanks, uh, Dr. Shariza. So the point is uh, when you have discussion regarding dialysis, um, it's best to involve the proxy decision maker or the family member so that we can align expectation from all parties and hopefully they are more consistent in their decision making. Yes, definitely. Because sometimes what happens, you find that family members, they have plenty of children. Sometimes mm -hmm. they have five children, three children. Mm -hmm. uh, some are overseas, some are away. So you just make sure that one person, this one person or one proxy or segregate decision maker yes. will pass the message to all the family members. Mm -hmm. Everybody will have different expectations and different goals. Mm -hmm. And the patient may uh, wish may not be able to fulfill. Uh, I would say that it's not fair for the patient. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Shariza. Yes. Dr. Muhammad Nizar Nathan Khan. Good oh. evening. I'm working in a district hospital in Sabah. How should we approach psychosocial support in district hospital for this group of patients? I think uh, psychosocial support is more about communication. So when we talk about communication, of course, we always talk uh, psychosocial. We ask them what is their worry. Uh, majority of the time, family members worry about whether this is the right decision. They will ask, doctor, betul ke uh, uh, keputusan ni? Boleh ke kita buat tak dialisis? Because everybody has always generally feel that patients who have end-stage renal disease must do dialysis. Mm -hmm. So I have given in your talk all the evidence that it is a not acceptable necessary. option. Mm -hmm. It is not something that is not acceptable. It is there, but uh, maybe we are not aware. So now I'm making you aware. So you have to ask them, number one, what is your concern with not doing dialysis? Would he die suffering? So you must say, here we are, we are controlling the symptoms. These are things that will happen. For instance, yes, he will have breathlessness due to fluid overload, acidosis, but we can help control with maybe opioids, uh, diuretics to help, so they know how to address. 
Then they said, what happened if patient become unconscious? Do I need to come to the hospital also? Again, you must tell them where they can look for help. Majority of the time, psychosocial support is going, just providing them the right information for whatever concern they have. Uh, so once you provide them with all the right information, uh, the psychosocial distress or anxiety will come down. Okay, so this is not one of the that's why uh, you have to have the referral early so that we build rapport, trust. Uh, for my patients in the renal palliative uh, clinic, they all know where to find me. They know they can always find me on a Wednesday morning at that particular room. If at any point they need to turn up to the ED, they also have on the blue card how to contact me and tell the doctor in charge that they, uh, they are under me. So people in the ED, I've also met up with my colleagues in ED, giving them their talk, saying that, oh, these are the patients who are under renal palliative care. They will not benefit from RRC. They have already chosen this. They are aware of the growth. So they will contact me if at any point these patients turn up to the ED. So it's more about communication, advocating about our service. Okay, I hope I answered that. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Shariza. Very comprehensive. Next question is uh, Dr. Noor Hasima Mohamad would like to ask if you can share anything about palliative dialysis. Okay. So, uh, palliative dialysis here, uh, <laughs> this is that to me at this point of time, palliative, I know uh, I know of some nephrologists who have started or they start prescribing dialysis at a PRN basis. However, uh, as a palliative consultant, I will feel, number one, I will question and ask, what is the actual goal of providing PRN dialysis? So providing dialysis actually to, re to actually is a prolongation therapy of life, right? It's not curative. So is there any intention to uh, improve quality of life for a particular time? Uh, or to reach a goal, maybe, oh, uh, they need this dialysis to reach uh, the sun's wedding at this end of the month, uh, something like that. But then this palliative dialysis role is not from me, it's from a nephrologist. So we have to get the nephrologist input on why this nephro uh, have started this uh, dialysis PRN. Uh, so far, uh, some may say that uh, they are still thinking about decision, uh, they're not so sure. So uh, I, I'm not clear because there's no guideline on this mm -hmm. uh, and I cannot comment. But uh, roughly what I have been uh, put up to by certain patients, because some patients have come and said, oh, I'm on dialysis uh, when necessary only. What do you think, doctor? So uh, exploring is actually, uh, they are not uh, yet uh, making the decision. But I feel uh, maybe informed consent, actual uh, information have not been addressed fully for the patient and family to help them make their right decision appropriately. So that's my answer for that. Okay. Can I ask you, Dr. Shariza, is there a yes. formal definition on palliative uh, dialysis? Because uh, there no. are... We, we, I don't know whether some people crash into ED and they got like urgent dialysis PRN and some has a catheter or a, a fistula but they dialyze maybe once a week sometimes because of logistic or because of geographical reason. Which, uh -huh. which one? Are they both palliative dialysis or? Uh, I, I wouldn't say palliative. There's no palliative dialysis. Number one, okay. we are clear. There is no palliative dialysis. The dialysis that is instituted as PRN, we mm. must know it is the decision to dialyze and the uh, the regime that is decided is by the nephrologist. So it is a nephrologist decision for the PRN dialysis or when necessary. So we have to ask the nephrology what is the ultimate goal or uh, Objective of this dialysis lah. It's not palliative. I wouldn't say it's palliative. There's no definition of palliative dialysis. There is no role of palliative dialysis. Mm. So this PRN, yes, if somebody have, for instance, somebody come in with acute uh, infection, having AKI, acidosis, yes, we do uh, dialysis when necessary because we want to wait for AKI recovery that can go up to six weeks, right? But then these patients have already 
have a uh, for instance uh, have already established end stage renal disease so their kidneys are already uh, you know uh, not functioning mm-hmm. so they would already require regular dialysis why they do uh, do PRN dialysis uh, is not clear mm-hmm. so this uh, we have to bring up to the nephrology so far when I talk to some nephrologists uh, that I know of some consultant they, uh, they are not supportive of this uh, palliative dialysis, uh, what they call palliative dialysis is actually dialysis PRN because ultimately there's no goal of care, no goal of care, no objective. Just mm-hmm. simply, oh, uh, when acidosis, I do when necessary. So, uh, there's no clear definition, what? Mm-hmm. And then, how do we define uh, this is at the disease end of the disease trajectory? Mm-hmm. So, we cannot uh, predict based on disease trajectory also. Mm-hmm. This is not about reversible cost already. This is something disease progress and have established that diagnosis. Mm-hmm. So that's what I said. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Sharisa. There's a similar question in the chat box as well by Rebecca Wong. So she asked, um, can the decision of palliative renal care be reverted if patient change or his or her mind? I think you answered that in your lecture. Yes, yes, they can change their mind. And she asked, is emergency or urgent HD considered a palliative measure for people with overload or metabolic acidosis? Okay, so number one, I will address the question again. Yes, the decision can be reversed. However, mm. we have to tell and acknowledge to the patient uh, that if you start dialysis late, and when they are more symptomatic, the outcome is poorer and there's more complication. Mm. So they must be aware of that. But uh, I have had patients who converted is normal because they maybe change their goal of care, goal of life, or even predicted quality of life may change. So that is okay. However, they must know the later they start dialysis at a poorer EGFR and with more symptoms, the outcome is poorer. And they may develop certain complications, maybe ischemic heart disease or even a other angina or even complication of bleeding. Okay, so that's okay. So if at any point when they come in to the, uh, the uh, ED uh, with acidosis and they want to do urgent dialysis, uh, that one, if this patient have established not for any renal replacement therapy, it's no more urgent dialysis. <laughs> it's actually we are converting to uh, renal replacement therapy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if the patient for any family say, oh no, I want dialysis, maybe. Uh, at the you know half state dialysis half state no uh, you think that difficult you want to do dialysis now it's okay but then the decision later on uh, about withdrawal everything have to be by the nephrologist saying whether or not this is total or this is actually more uh, detrimental to continue uh, then more decision lah. okay mm. and, and of course uh, when patients come in more ill the complication and the uh, mortality is higher. That is very uh, something that we have to do lah, uh, and also uh, address. So when we talk about renal palliative, I would say we spend a lot of time talking uh, about expectation, about goal, awareness. Whether some people say, oh, I'm, it's okay because I'm asymptomatic now, so I don't worry. But you, you have to ask, establish and say to them, do you know that there will be time when your kidneys are not functioning, you become mm-hmm. unconscious, and death may occur, oh, it's okay. Or they say, oh, really, I will die? <laughs> so how to prevent death? Uh, so then maybe that's uh, a different um, uh, discussion altogether and we have to refer back to the nephrologist for RRC counselling again. Maybe mm-hmm. the miscommunication, so again. But if they say, I'm okay. I've had patients who said to me, Coming in, uh, 75 years old, very good, well performing, still or uh, driving, Miska, and he came to me, he said, yes, I'm aware I have uh, kidney failure, uh, but I don't want to do dialysis. Why? Uh, I say, I buy a house near the mosque. Every day I go to the mosque five times. If you can make sure that I do my prayer five times in the mosque after I start dialysis, I will go. So this is a quality of life that is expected that the patient wants. So like in the consideration, they say if it's not a quality of life that the patient wants, mm-hmm. then we cannot provide. It is fair for us to forego dialysis for this patient. So we are mm-hmm. clear. So guideline is there. The only thing is whether we are clear with the guideline and how we want to support the patient. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. I hope I answered it a bit long. Thanks, uh, Sharita. Thank you yes. so much. So just a, a follow-up question on that. How many percent of your patients from your experience actually change their mind? So many referred to you and uh, then eventually after seeing you or one or two, two sessions uh, with you, change their mind and wanted dialysis. Do you have a rough yes. uh, percentage yes. in your mind? Yes, thank you. So basically, uh, so since my service started, I have about around 230 patients already who have uh, started and also died with me. So out of this, I only have one patient who converted oh. uh, to HG. This was an old matron uh, who actually had no family members all overseas. Suddenly, yeah. one day, the daughter said, come back and say, oh, I will support my mother. So the mother... Uh, as a culturally right, they say, okay, I will do so. But she started mm. off uh, dialysis with more symptoms, mm. aware of the prognosis, everything. However, she's still doing dialysis, not an issue. Uh, like again, it's always a repetitive discussion about concern, expectation. They can always ask you uh, why uh, can they convert, can they not convert. Like I said in the consideration of the guideline, it's okay for us to explain. Sometimes they are just clearing their doubt. And whenever, like in our culture, when they see one relative, one relative say like that, another friend say like that, so they get confused. It's okay for us, the treating physician or even treating doctor, to discuss about this concern. And I think it's a valid concern that we have to address. Mm, thank you. Thank you very much. Next question is, uh, let's take a question from the hospice side. When would you decide yes. to refer patients to community hospice? Okay, so uh, for, uh, thank you Nadia for this uh, question. Uh, so Nadia is a hospice user. So what happened is uh, for patients with ancestral disease, I would uh, look into their prognos prognosticate them. As they, their prognosticate is less than six months, I will start referring to the hospice. Because uh, with these patients, uh, end stationary disease on conservative care, the care can be long and very prolonged. And majority of the time, they may sort of like come erratically with symptoms. And these symptoms can be controlled. So, but then as their prognostication is uh, prognosticate, their prognosis, prognosis is shorter, they will have more symptoms, more lethargy. So, this is when they need to come and uh, need the hospice support in the community to look into symptom control and also titrate the opioids that can help with symptom control. So that's why I would really wait until uh, towards the end of their disease spectrum before I refer to community. And some of these patients, and patient failure patients, I have had a patient with EGFR2 still walking to the clinic with some fetus with Mima, just because she likes to go out of the house and want to see me. So it's okay. So as long as the patient said they are okay to come to clinic, I will allow them to come to clinic. But maybe the uh, interval between clinic a bit shorter. Lah. Uh, if they are okay to get community involvement, I will always get them when their prognosis is about six months and below. Yeah. I hope Thanks, I answered Charissa. that. Yeah, thank you. I, I find it challenging to decide on the timing to refer to engage hospice for non-cancer patient. Because as we know, their disease trajectory is a bit different from cancer patients where there are a greater degree of uncertainty. And when they do deteriorate, for example, let's say, um, let's say um, heart failure or ESRF, the symptoms sometimes may require hospital care. So what I mean is uh, things like, let's say they become, they have hypertensive emergency or APO that requires high oxygen or subcut, subcutaneous drugs or, you know, some kind of NIV, then it's going to be quite hard for the hospice uh, to handle unless the family is uh, uh, easily contented with just like opioid to palliate the symptoms. But if let's say, you know, nowadays we have uh, the machine, the oximeter everywhere, the, the family is quite, can be quite anxious when they see that the SBO2 is dropping. So I don't know whether, um, how comfortable are the hospice in dealing with a non-cancer, but I do feel like sometimes um, those patients, when they deteriorate, they may require sort of hospital-based care uh, sometimes. What's your uh, comment? Definitely, definitely right, Dr. Ng. 
uh, want you uh, about this. Yeah. Uh, and because these patients, uh, they are at end or just end organ damage, they are more familiar and they feel safer to mm. be in the hospital. Uh, yeah. And then uh, uh, that's the reason the hospice may be uh, uh, somebody in the, uh, I mean, the transition between uh, waiting for to admit into the ward before they come into the hospital uh, mm. to just control the symptoms. Some would, now that's why uh, it is still a discussion before we can refer to hospice because some mm. patients say, no, I still want to come to the hospital. And then yeah. if you say, uh, in order to come to the hospital, then they feel offended, you know, they say, oh, you don't want to see mm. anyone. No, no, you can still come and see mm. us, definitely. But we just don't want the hassle of them uh, waiting in the ED. So uh, yeah. if these patients, they still want uh, majority of the time, I give my ward number, and then uh, if they have any symptoms, I ask them to call. Uh, uh, my nurse will then pass the uh, number to us, and then we return call to look into symptom control or whether they need to admit straight away to the ward. Lah. So without waiting in ED for a long time, you know, ED nowadays, of course, sometimes uh, it's overcrowded, and then they need long waiting time. Again, I would say entirely after our discussion with family and patients when they want the hospice to be involved, but mm. not too early. Because when it's too early, I feel, or when they less in terms, the hospice may have to discharge patients and come back for service later on. Uh, that's not best ideal, I feel. Yeah. Yes. Can I also uh, ask you, Dr. Shariza, on the same issue? So let's say patient ended up in hospital, uh, and they are clear cut for conservative care means uh, they are consistent that they don't want dialysis. But let's say they crash with like blood pressure of 200, you know, hypertensive emergency or APO, would you take into palliative ward or would you say, uh, dear nephrologist, can you can you take mm -hmm. take this case because the ward is uh, the staff and the ward uh, monitoring uh, frequency is not is ill equipped to look after this group of patients? Uh, no. So any patients, because we are all physicians, right? Uh, we are we all have internal medicine. Uh, so what happened is uh, any patients who are already under renal palliative care or are already under my care will be admitted to PCU, primary uh, palliative care unit, if they admit for any symptoms, uh, maybe fluid overload, acidosis, anemia, or even uh, hypertensive crisis, we will admit and uh, manage accordingly from there. Uh -huh. And even uh -huh. if they come in with end of life, it comes into uh, PCU. Uh, less likely, uh, if they are already under palliative, it will be under palliative. Uh, it won't go to nephrology. Mm -hmm. Unless so you, yeah. they wish uh, or they express their wish that they want to uh, discuss about uh, RRC with nephrology, everything. Even if they are admitted to PCU, you can always call nephro to have a review and we discuss this treatment option. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, Thank you. We, we help to offload the nephrology ward. Uh -huh. But we yeah. are still in contact mm -hmm. and close friends, so we can always call each other to come and support. Mm. Okay. My concern is some of the palliative care unit may not have the capacity, for example, to look after NIV. And uh, when, you know, PCU, the last thing you want is the, the alarm keep on going off and disturbing the rest of the patients when the blood pressure should up and then you keep you have to titrate the GTRN or the NIV, there's a leakage. So the machine yeah. will keep on beeping. Do, do you uh, think... Um, so I, I feel that suitable? one would be... I think that would depend on individual PCU, how mm. your support system is, everything. So uh, in my ward, we have double-bedded, single-bedded, and even the four or six-bedded. So we can arrange accordingly uh, to where the patient needs and uh, internal medicine problems or issues, we can always uh, sort, uh, sort it out and look into that matter, not at least, you know. Uh -huh. So I feel it is very individualized to each PCU uh, mm. unit, yeah? Okay. Mm. For a I patient have... then, yeah. Yes. Sorry, you were saying something? No, uh, we have one more question. If you don't yeah, mind. we do. Uh, yeah, we have two more, a few more. We still have five, six minutes. I think we're going to okay, be yeah, able never, to manage. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, Rebecca, she has more questions. So, she asked whether erythropoietin is available for patients who are on conservative care instead of dialysis. Definitely. 
So one of the uh, because today we are just talking about role, I have not discussed about symptom control. If symptom control of patient, it does uh, anemia, renal anemia is one of the com- important component that we have to address. And uh, it has multiple papers have also posted that uh, if the hemoglobin level or patient with intestinal disease who do not have uh, good hemoglobin level or anemia, their quality of life is reduced. So people or patients on conservative uh, palliative care have to optimize their renal, uh, their renal anemia. So I do prescribe erythropoietin regularly for all my patients unless they are at the end of life, so they, this do not benefit them already. Thanks. So, so in KKM, as far as I understand, uh, the budget, the funding only available for erythropoietin only available for patients who are on dialysis means there's no allocation for patients who choose not to or who are not suitable for dialysis and this is of course an irony I think Dr. Rafida probably is working on trying to overcome this problem because it's ethically it, it doesn't make sense um, Definitely. but so that means patients need to buy their own erythropoietin if they decide that they don't want to dialyze or uh, for medical reason they are not fit for dialysis despite crashing uh-huh. multiple times to ED for anemia, anemic symptoms? The papers, uh, I mean, there's a lot of papers, Hong Kong papers saying yeah. about erythropoietin in conservative care patients. So it is beneficial. And I I, I, I also have had uh, talks with uh, Rafida, everything, uh, to talk about symptom control. So this is very important. Anemia, renal anemia is something that is, is easily controlled, should be done. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. She not come in and then blood transfusion. So I, don't, I, I feel strongly that all my patients have erythropoietin. Okay? Yes. So do you also say that, would you also say that um, for renal supportive care clinic run by palliative team, the palliative doctor should also be very familiar with uh, uh, erythropoietin, uh, yes. IV iron, and yes. med- managing mineral bone disease, uh, the calcium carbonates, the phosphate binders? Yes, uh, it- yes. Uh, I, I feel yes. Uh, that's the reason we uh, in uh, palliative, uh, we are all uh, basically internal medicine uh, palliative, uh, physician, either MMAT or even MRCC trained. So we should already have some basis in nephrology. So this would already help us in the management of renal palliative patients. Okay. Uh, yes. Right. Last questions. Uh, oh, there are one more. So Dr. Ko Wai Kit asking about senior patients. Uh, he said some senior patients refuse RD maybe because of fear or misconception or bad experience. Uh, do you think it's fair to offer them a trial of dialysis? Okay. So number one for this, uh, it's quite common. So you have to talk to them about what is their misconception, what is their bad experience. You know, sometimes... Uh, these patients, they have started dialysis at a portal EGFR with more symptom uh, burden. So that may cause them to have poorer uh, outcome from dialysis. So we have to ask them what is their concern and expectation first. If at any point they say, oh, do they want, they want a trial of dialysis. If they express they want a trial, we also must understand what do you mean by trial? Some people say, I want try one time. I have had patients. I want to try one time. <laughs> I said one time wouldn't benefit. It has to be uh, generally a uh, uh, agreed upon time, uh-huh, which the nephrologist agrees to. Because I am not uh, giving the regime for dialysis to the nephrologist. If everybody agrees for a dialysis next step, okay, one month or six weeks uh, with a uh, catheter or dialysis, and everybody knows uh, the risk, then we can do for a trial. But if, for instance, my son want me to dialyze, I don't want to dialyze, but I have a fistula, I try lah, then we have to look into expectation and concern, awareness, prognosis again. Talk to family members. I have had patients, a patient who is a government servant, who came in, he can talk, uh, he read newspaper, WhatsApp the family members every night, asking them how are they, everything. But he's very clear, I don't want to do dialysis. But the children said to him, because they are all uh, can afford, come to the clinic, say, I want my father to do dialysis. Even brought to the private side, 
Mm-hmm. I said I want uh, my father to start dialysis. The father said, okay, I don't want to start dialysis. So they said, uh, then negotiate, negotiate. Okay, do a fistula. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the father said, okay, I got a fistula. Mm-hmm. But then don't touch my fistula. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, the choice of dialysis is the patient's right. Autonomy mm-hmm. is to the patient. So we must remember, autonomy is the patient. Mm-hmm. No matter what, the patient understands the least benefit. So if they say, they don't want, I cannot force on them. Again, we have to talk about uh, who is the one who's requesting for the child. Is it for the child's mental health or the yeah. patient's mental health? All this, again, we, it's a further discussion. It's not no, no, but the trial must be, uh, I would say, must be have a nice timing, lah, not one time or one week. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the pet patient say, can I try one time? Cannot, lah. Because even if we initiate dialysis, it's not for four hours. There's a regime that we have to follow. So all this, they must understand. Okay? Uh, okay. This a lot of discussion. More like uh, case discussion. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thanks for all the great questions. There's one last one by Dr. Wu. So she's also from the hospice side. Would you mind just take one last question from her? Yes, definitely. definitely. So you mentioned about six months uh, prognosis, prognosis. So she's gonna ask, she's, she's asking you how do how do they know whether the patient has reached the last six months or not? Well, basically, of course, number one, uh, I would say uh, this whether six months is because we have already had the like, rapport with the patient. Yeah. Ideally, conservative care in uh, in UMMC, we get the rapport at stage 3A or 3B. Yeah. So we have already developed that uh, rapport until stage 5, EGFR, uh, stage 5, right? So we know how they have progressed, their energy level, their acidosis. So when this acidosis fluid overload is recurrent and when we, uh, the medication that we have using not as responsive as previously, we can roughly said that yes, this patient is coming towards his end of life and prognostication would be less than that. Lah. So mm. this would be our predictor. Sometimes if they develop more complications, sometimes previously never had hyperkalemia. Now, persistent hyperkalemia, even you have to put him on regular calimate every day. So these are things that may also predict his prognosis. So uh, it will be generally his clinical parameters and also his clinical uh, condition and symptoms. Mm. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shariza, for answering all that questions. That's quite a lot. And thank you okay. very much, everyone, for your wonderful, uh, very relevant questions. With that, I think we're going to uh, end the session, but I think we have something to share first. Uh, uh, event promotions. So yeah, I just wanted to share that um, yeah, uh, we are going to have this uh, Kidney Supportive Care Symposium in Sabah uh, early September. And we have featured speaker from Dr. Rafida joining and uh, nephrologists and palliative doctors uh, from Australia and Singapore sharing with us their, their experience in uh, managing patients with end-stage renal failure, choosing for conservative care. So if you're interested, uh, please register yourself. Unfortunately, the, this time is going to be just physical. So if you feel like coming, dropping by Kota Kinabang for a holiday and attend this symposium, uh, by all means, please, uh, we are looking forward to, to see you. Thank you very much. If you need more information, do get in touch with the, the Royal College uh, team. With that, I hand it back to Dr. Lim. Dr. Lim, any housekeeping or any message? I think that's all for today. And uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Ng and Dr. Sariza for the informative talk. And with that, the end of our session for today. And hope